my mouth as I speak. Would you bow your heads with me? Loving Heavenly Father, I should remember that I'm talking about your people this morning. I'm talking about your church, the church that you brought into existence. No human being brought this church into existence. You did. And as many problems as we might think it has, it is still the only object on earth on which you bestow your supreme regard. You are always watching over it and the people in it, and you're strengthening us by your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that I will not say anything that needlessly hurts your church. But if I do say something, let it be uh, corrective and instructive, and that we will take it in the spirit in which it is given, which is the same spirit in which you gave messages to the prophets of old, even though their messages were not well received, that uh, you will um, open our hearts and minds so that we will at least think about what you are trying to say to us today. Please grant this request in Jesus' name. Amen. Our subject today is Esau was a Seventh-day Adventist. If you would open your Bible to Genesis chapter 25, we'll go there. Genesis chapter 25, and I'll read from verse 29 to 34. And if you have the King James Version, which I'm using, you can read it along with me if you like. When you get there, say amen. amen. Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse 29. And Jacob sawed pottage. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now let us go back for a moment and reread verse 32. And listen to Esau's words. Behold, I am at the point to die. That is physical. That is temporal. That is visible. What profit shall this birthright do to me? That is spiritual. That is eternal. That is invisible. What profit is there of something eternal, invisible, and spiritual to me right now in my moment of physical need? All those needs are legitimate. But they overcame Esau to the point where they dominated his thinking and to the point that he lost sight of that which benefits us now and in the life to come. What profit shall this birthright do unto me? Verse 33. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And verse 34 is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The birthright was the most precious gift a young Hebrew man could expect in his life. A double portion of the father's wealth headship of the family, being the priest of the family, all those blessings. Jacob understood its value. Esau did not. And in his extremity, in his extreme situation, he despised the blessing. He despised the birthright. We can go back and read verse 32 again. And maybe we can apply it to ourselves today. 
Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do unto me? We find ourselves in extreme situations, don't we? Behold, I am 38 years old, and I am not yet married. What profit is, thou shalt not commit adultery, do unto me? Behold, I am divorced. I have five children. My paycheck is very small. What profit is, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, do unto me? Behold, I need this job. If I don't have this job, I will lose my house, I will lose my car, I will lose everything. What profit does, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, do unto me? Do you see the profit in being a Seventh-day Adventist? Do you see the profit in serving God? Job chapter 21. Job chapter 21. Starting at verse 7. What book? What book? Job. What chapter? What verse? Thank you. Verse 7, starting in verse 7. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not, their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and harp, and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him, and what profit should we have if we pray unto him? Do you see the profit in serving God? Some Christians don't. But if you are like that, you will never survive the time of trouble. Do you see the prophet of serving God? Do you see the prophet of living a biblically upright life? Or are you so dazzled by the world that you will say with Esau, what prophet is being a Seventh-day Adventist do unto me? If there is no prophet to you, you will not engage in evangelism. What do I mean? We have a health message. We have a health message. Ellen White writes in Medical, Missionary, Medical Ministry, page 49, paragraph 2, There are divinely appointed rules which, if observed, will keep human beings from disease and premature death. Well, let's pick that apart a little bit, shall we? What does divinely appointed mean? What is the source? What is the source? God. What does if mean? Conditional. Conditional. Okay, let's put those two things together. We have divinely appointed rules which, if observed, will keep human beings from disease and premature death. We have a health message that other people use for their benefit. When you do things God's way, you are blessed, even if you are an atheist. If an atheist returns a tithe, he receives the tithe blessing. Why is that? Because God is not a man that he should lie. 
He said, if you return a tithe to me, I will bless you so much that you will not have room to receive it. Did God not say that? Yes, he did. He promised it, and he does not lie. And even if you are an atheist, if you return a tithe to God, he will bless you. But we have a health message, and we despise it the way Esau despised his birthright. We have a message that would keep us out of hospitals. We have a message that would keep our money in our pockets. We have a message that would make us fit to serve God wherever he saw fit to send us. South Dakota, India, Africa, Idaho, Washington, wherever he sees fit. Healthier people are more effective people. Now don't get me wrong, God loves sick people. But I heard this one time, and I think it's very appropriate. Strong people are harder to kill, and generally more useful. So I say, in the hearing of Almighty God, we have a health message. But when that message is brought, it is despised. We hear this, get rid of those people telling me what to eat and what to drink and what not to eat and what not to drink and get rid of the people that tell me when I should go to sleep. Get rid of them, they are disrupting my lifestyle. I understand there's young children in the audience today and they might say that to their mommies and daddies. Is that disrupting your lifestyle? To be told something that may not be palatable to you? God is not so narrow-minded as to care whether I eat beef or pork or crocodiles. He doesn't care how I dress or how I treat my body. God is not that narrow-minded. Yes, he is. I'm going to start this scripture, and I want you to finish it for me. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God is that narrow-minded. So we have a health message, but we despise it. We also have a complementary source of wisdom called the writings of Ellen G. White. Do you thank God for the ministry of Ellen White? I do, but that light and truth that God gave us, we despise. I've heard someone mention a study of a survey, and I would like to get my hands on the results of that study and look at it for myself, which indicate that reading the writings of Ellen White contributes to spiritual growth among Seventh-day Adventists. I really would like to see that. God sometimes has to scrape away our sin, sometimes gently, sometimes roughly, but sometimes he has to use a jackhammer. <clears throat> Neither way is pleasant, but we need it just to survive spiritually, but spiritual survival is not enough. God wants us to flourish and advance, and he has given us a means by which to accomplish that, and that is the ministry of Ellen White. All the young people I might speak to in the audience today are a little too young maybe of thinking of girlfriends or boyfriends. But if you are, read messages to young people. If you're considering marriage, read Adventist Home. If you are considering bringing a child into the world, read Child Guidance. Now, with this resource in hand, could you understand the insult to God when we turn to sources like Joyce Meyer or T.D. Jakes or Benny Hinn or Beth Moore for carnal knowledge? No wonder no one knows who Seventh-day Adventists are. They know who ISIS is. They know who Antifa is. 
They know who Michael Jordan is, and they know all the Hollywood stars, but who are Seventh-day Adventists? People might be concerned that we use the writings of Ellen White to replace the Bible, but that is not the case. She complements the Bible, and her writings support. They do not replace or conflict with Bible truth. Do you like stories? I heard this little story. There is a story of a minister somewhere on planet Earth, and he will not be identified nor will the place be identified. Uh, <clears throat> he received a letter from his conference, the Seventh-day Adventist minister received a letter from his conference in which the ministers had to sign saying, I will not quote the writings of Ellen White from the pulpit. He did not sign that letter. God bless him. So he was called into the conference office and asked, why did you not sign this document? He wanted to know why. He found out that one of the conference officials was on the local association of witches. How many of you know by heart the scripture, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20? It goes like this. Believe in the Lord your God, so yet shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Now, people ask sometimes, do you believe in Ellen White? No. I believe in God, but I believe what Ellen White says. There is a difference. You believe in the Lord your God. It does not say believe in the prophets. It says believe them. That is to say, believe what they say. You believe in God. Are you following me? Ellen G. White is not God. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. This church officially regards Ellen Gould White as having exercised the biblical gift of prophecy. Just like Jeremiah and Isaiah even though her writings are not part of the biblical canon, but they have the same source. And neglect of the writings of Ellen White soon leads to a distaste for the Bible itself. So do yourself a favor. Build on solid rock buy her books. You have a computer and an internet service. Let's get a little more modern here. I still like books with pages. And I, when I go to church, I like to hear people flipping pages. That is my personal preference. It's okay if you use your cell phone for a Bible. That use of a cell phone in church is acceptable. But do yourself a favor, buy her books. Every youth should have messages to young people and education. Every youth should have the book Christian Education. Everyone should be familiar with the Conflict of the Ages series. Now I'm going to have, ask you some questions. What are those books in chronological order? This side. What's the first book? The Interaction of Prophets. This side, what's the next one? Okay, this side, what's the next one? All right, and then this one? Acts of the Apostles. And altogether, what's the last one? The Great Controversy. If you read these five books, you will educate yourselves in the essentials of what we call present truth. But like Esau, we despise our birthright. We despise our health message. We despise the Sabbath. We despise the Holy Ghost. I have a friend that says that the Holy Ghost is not God. We despise the Godhead. We despise the concept of the remnant. 
We despise the concept of being a special people in God's eyes. We despise the concept of the teaching of victory over sin. We despise the two-phase ministry of Jesus in the sanctuary. We despise the investigative judgment. We even despise creation itself, as Esau despised his birthright. If he were alive today, he would make an excellent Seventh-day Adventist, because we despise that which God has given us for our benefit. Now, this despising is not an organizational despising. There was no vote taken at the General Conference saying, let's despise Ellen White. It is not the case. It is just so widespread in the church. Esau despised his birthright because he couldn't see past his momentary physical need. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I would not say that we despise the truth of our education as it should be in the church. But perhaps we do despise the system. Ellen White wrote in the book Education, page 13, paragraph 1, Our ideas of education take too narrow and too low a range. There is need of a broader scope, a higher aim. True education means more than the pursuit of a certain course of study. It means more than a preparation for the life that now is. It has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to man. It is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. It prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. I heard a preacher at a, at a conference, he asked some people what they're studying. When I'm studying astrophysics, okay? Why? Because I like math. Okay? Ask somebody else, why, I mean, what are you studying? I'm studying biology. Why? Because I like to know how the human body works. Ask someone else, what are you studying? I'm studying history. Why? Because I like to see the fallacies of human nature. But not one of those persons answered him, they are studying that because they want to use it to the glory of God in their career. If you want to be an astrophysicist, that's fine. If you like math, but whatever course you pursue, God wants to know, are you going to use that to further his kingdom? Is your primary purpose the glory of God? In the book Desire of Ages, page 20, verse 2, Ellen White writes, There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There's no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass but has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe forth fragrance and unfold their beauty in blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean itself, the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land but takes to give. The mists ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth that it may bring forth and bud. Is your primary purpose the glory of God? 1 Corinthians 10.31, the Apostle Paul, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. When you say whatsoever, what is excluded? Nothing. Whatever you do, 
do all to the glory of God. So let us not despise what God has given to us. If we did not have the spirit of prophecy, we would have a generic church that is no different from any other church on the face of this earth. Indeed, we would be just like the world. God called this church into existence in the 1800s, just as he called Abraham. Abraham did not call himself. God did. This church didn't call itself into existence. Nor did Ellen White, nor did James White, or J.N. Andrews. God called this church into existence. So don't despise a privilege that God has given to no other people on the face of the earth to be the depositaries of present truth. So don't despise the health message. Follow it. Don't despise the educational message. Encourage it. Go to school, go to work, but make sure you do so for the primary purpose of the glory of God. And regard this. The Word of God is your most precious possession. Revelation 19, verse 13 says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That Word is the foundation of our health system. That Word is the foundation of our educational system. That Word is the foundation of our preaching of the Gospel. And again, the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3.11 that other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, and that is Christ Jesus. I have another story for you. It's a story of embarrassment. The story is of a couple of Seventh-day Adventist ministers one time who went to a Sunday preacher to ask him how he built his church to such staggering proportions. The Sunday preacher turned around, reached back on the shelf, and he pulled out the book Evangelism. Those Seventh-day Adventist ministers should have dropped dead from embarrassment. Another time, another man, he went to a uh, an official who ran a school to find out he, how he ran his school so effectively. The man turned around, pulled a book off his shelf. What book was that? The book Education. We must stop going to the Philistines to sharpen our axes. Why shouldn't we invite Sunday preachers to preach in our pulpits? Because the Bible says, come out of her, my people. God said, come out. Now, God loves everybody. He loves T.D. Jakes. He loves the Pope. He loves Bill Gates. But he's not going to invite them to preach into his pulpits. Do you love Jesus? Amen. Amen. Do you raise your hand if you love Jesus? Do you mean that? I'm asking you to make a commitment to Christ today to say, Father, I, I commit myself or I recommit myself to Jesus Christ and recommit myself to present truth, which no other church on the face of the earth has. Now, I've said that before. And I got talked to after the sermon. But brothers and sisters, there is no other church on the face of this earth that has present truth. Amen. How many of you will say, as I make choices in life, let me first think of God's glory? How many of you will say that? As Paul, as Peter, as James, and John the Baptist gave their lives, I am willing to die for truth. I don't know if you will have to. I remember when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, the idea came into my head that I was going to live until he came in the clouds of glory. I don't know if he means that to be true for me. 
But if he does, he is going to see to it. He is going to see to it that I can stand through whatever is going to happen. I may not have to die for truth, but am I willing? So are you willing? I'm just asking you to make a commitment in your mind. And you tell God that you're going to do it. And I hope and pray that he finds ways to hold you to it. Because we have ways of weaseling out of what we promise to God, don't we? So make a commitment and hold yourself to it. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, who said, Greater love hath no man than this, that had he laid down his life for his friends. And you can say that because he gave his life for us. In his name, I ask you to give us the same love that he had, dear God, to be willing to lay down our lives for you. But before we get to that point, Father, let us live in support of the educational system that you created. And let us live in support of the health message you gave us as part of the mission of this church. A pastor told me a long time ago that it's easy to say we would be willing to die for you. But perhaps the harder part would be willing to live for you. With our lives, let us give to support and encourage the use of the writings of Ellen White. Give us a love for this gift and let us stop despising our birthright. Ignite in us a love for the mission of this church to prepare the world for the return of Jesus Christ. Let us realize that we are preparing for his return one way or another, whether to be lost or saved. Let us prepare then to meet you in love and not in despair. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.